Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to convince you at the end of my talk that uh, abdominal hypertension is an important issue, not only in the ICU, but also in the operating uh, theater. I have to disclose I'm a member of the Medical Advisory Board of Potion, which is now under Marquet uh, getting it. In 2004, we gathered in beautiful New South Australia, and we founded this illustrious society, the World Society of Abdominal Compartment Syndrome. At the time, we were only six, so it just takes six people to start a World Society. At the time, it was also possible to have Fox Creek Wines as a major sponsor, so we had wine tasting breaks instead of coffee breaks, and during those breaks, we have written down the initial consensus definition, which I will tell you a little bit later on. Some may think of this society as a sect or an occult group or an illustrious group of people, and yes, I have to admit that sometimes we do speak Latin, and yes, of course, I have a bias. What I would like to do is, after a brief introduction, uh, explain you the importance of abdominal hypertension on cardiodynamics when it comes to preload, contractility, afterload, and also functional hemodynamics and how to assess fluid responsiveness. I'll introduce a little bit of cars, I'm fond of cars, and then we'll wrap things up. I forgot this disclosure, I received this beautiful gown from an Uzbekistan professor, uh, which was in blue velvet and golden uh, broderie. Once you wear it, you can see that Paolo Pelosi, Jan de Waal, a lot of eminent professors want to stand next to you on the picture. Why do you need to know this? Well, maybe you don't. Maybe you like it because it's something fresh and new, Maybe I don't know everything about it, but I'm sure that it will change the way you will look at your patient at the bedside. So let me ask a question. Could you just raise your hand? Who measures intra-abdominal pressure? Okay. I think it's a fair number. I think it's 62.3% uh, of the audience, which is fantastic. <laughs> of course, we've all seen patients after massive fluid uh, resuscitation uh, totally swollen up uh, with a distended abdomen. But did you measure the intra-abdominal pressure? Yes. And we've all seen those patients, massive fluid resuscitated, swollen abdomens, and then suddenly kidney failure, and we start with renal replacement therapy. But did you measure the pressure? And we've all seen the patients after fluid resuscitation going in multiple organ failure and eventually dying in your ICU. Did you measure the pressure? I'm sincerely convinced that worldwide, even today, patients die with unrecognized abdominal compartment syndrome. So it's not a stupid thing to measure the abdominal pressure. If you do a PubMed search, you see an exponential increase on studies reporting on abdominal hypertension and compartment syndrome. And going back to the consensus paper written with the Fox Creek wines tasting, uh, it should be been beautiful weather in Noosa in December. It was full summer in Australia, but it was raining cats and dogs. So we were sitting, drinking, and writing these definitions. But what we realized is that this paper has been the most cited paper of intensive care medicine. So we realized also that there is a need to understand more about abdominal hypertension and compartment syndrome. And that's why we revised uh, the definitions in 2013. It's available uh, under open uh, access. You can download it. Already two centuries ago, people started measuring pressures in the thorax and the abdomen and found that when abdominal pressure is increased, there are difficulties with respiration and difficulties with cardiac output. So in summary, about one in four of your patients will have abdominal hypertension on admission, which is a pressure above 12. And about 5% will develop a compartment syndrome, also medical patients, which is a pressure above 20 with new onset organ failure. And if you don't treat it, mortality can be as high Focus as 50 to 70%. The sucks because the abdominal pressure is pressing his sound? cava. Can't ventilate because his belly's compressing his lungs. Okay, hold compression. Direct abdominal pressure measurement. Very high. 42 centimeters. More than enough to cause end organ damage. Okay, resume compressions, 10 blade. Ma'am, what's your name? Marnie. Your husband's pancreatitis is causing swelling of all the abdominal organs. Another 50 of Lido. Pushing it. He doesn't need cardiac meds. He needs to be decompressed. Luca, you know I'm right. So there is no return of spontaneous circulation. Uh -huh. Pick up two sets. Tracks superficial layers. New CPR. He won't need it after this. 
until they stop CPR. Back in sinus with the pulse. Back in sinus rhythm. So, I think it's a fantastic and it's a real life uh, example of abdominal compartment syndrome. What we saw was a patient with severe acute pancreatitis, free abdominal fluids, <clears throat> cardiac failure, cardiac arrest, CPR without spontaneous circulation, ventilatory failure, difficult to ventilate, and abdominal pressure we heard was 42 centimeters of water, which is 30 millimeters of mercury, which is in abdominal compartment syndrome because of primary abdominal problems. It's a primary abdominal compartment syndrome and restoration of organ function after decompression. So the abdominal cavity is a technical miracle as it houses about 8.5 meter of intestine. And the abdominal cavity has some ridges, structures, bony structures, of course the abdominal wall and the diaphragm, and some flexible parts which we can intervene with, with some medication, sedatives, uh, and relaxations. So the determinants of a certain abdominal pressure within the abdominal cavity following an intra-abdominal volume increase are determined by gravity, by the uniformity of the compression, maybe some shear stress forces and contractions of the abdominal muscles. So when intra-abdominal pressure increases, this pressure will be transmitted to the other body compartments being the thorax and from the thorax to the brain. So an increase in intra-abdominal pressure will result in an increase in intracranial pressure. So this is what we refer to as abdominal thoracic index of transmission or abdominal cranial index of transmission. And these actions are dependent of actions of the diaphragm, abdominal muscle contractions and ribcage uh, actions. Something went wrong with the arrows in my slides. But you have to believe me that the average transmission from the abdomen to the thorax where the vascular structures are is about 50%. So for those interested to learn more, if you just send me an email after my talk, I can forward you some of uh, the PDFs. And more and more interaction as uh, attention has gone to the polycompartment syndrome and organ-organ uh, interactions. So if we fluid resuscitate our patient, there will be second and third spacing accumulation of fluids. Abdominal pressure will increase. This will compress uh, vena cava return, will reduce flow to the heart, a drop in cardiac output, reduction of flow to the organs, and multi-system organ failure may uh, occur. As an internist, I got interested by abdominal hypertension because increased pressures within the abdominal cavity has tremendous impact on organ function, not only within the abdomen, but also far outside, on the heart, on the lungs, on the brain. And these effects are aggravated in situations of hypovolemia and situations of positive pressure ventilation and high PEEP. And this is just a list of the cardiovascular effects of abdominal hypertension, which I would like now briefly uh, go over in uh, detail. So what about preload? There are four questions. Whether the CVP is a good indicator of venous return? Well, if abdominal pressure is increased, Initially, you may see an increase in venous uh, uh, return, but if abdominal pressure is further increased, then there will be a decrease in venous return. Animal data show that increases in intra-abdominal pressure are paralleled by increases in central venous pressure because of the increase in pleural pressure, which means that the CVB is probably not a good indicator. It's just a small part, and venous return is also determined by um, mean systemic filling pressure and maybe transmural CVP could have been a better uh, preload indicator. So the first point in abdominal hypertension is that CVP is not a good parameter for venous return. If we look at an hypothetical case of a patient, a baseline situation, then we would increase abdominal pressure with a Velcro belt. We would set the PEEP equal to the abdominal pressure we would remove the Velcro belt, so it's a decompression, and then remove the PEEP. So if you just bear in mind these five steps, and we look what this does to the intra-abdominal pressure, so the Velcro belt and the PEEP will increase abdominal pressure to levels of <laughs> abdominal hypertension. But similarly, also filling pressures will increase because of the transmission from 
uh, abdomen to thorax. And other studies have shown that abdominal hypertension increases CVP and wedge pressure. This makes the wedge pressure not a good preload indicator because at the final step we need to make sure that intra-abdominal pressures or abdominal pressure are not elevated because we zero the CVP against atmosphere uh, and not against intra-abdominal pressure. So a static CVP is not a good uh, parameter of, of preload in abdominal hypertension and a better alternative may be volumetric preload. So the guidelines, the old ones, the new ones, not so much, but in the past we were told to chase a CVP between 8 and 12. And the question is that in patients with abdominal hypertension may have a high baseline CVP, so you will never uh, have a trigger to start fluid resuscitation, so patients may get under uh, resuscitated. That's why I went back in my email, and in 2005, I sent this mail to Phil Dellinger, the first author of the Surviving Sepsis Campaign Guidelines, asking about CVP and asking about the impact of increased intrathoracic pressure. Phil responded that this was something for Mitch and Jean-Louis Vincent, so I sent an email to Mitch and Jean-Louis Vincent uh, asking about the CVP and abdominal pressure. So I got an answer back from Jean-Louis that intra-abdominal hypertension is important, but how to get it into the guidelines. So when the next guidelines came out, I was really curious, and I still found this CVP A to 12, but there was an asterisk. And an asterisk told that higher CVP targets were advocated in conditions where intra-abdominal pressure was increased. So I was very happy. So it is just an idea if you want to get something in the guidelines. I'm now trying to get cardiac output in the guidelines as a, a part of initial monitoring. So that's why we gave Jean-Louis a honorary membership of the society. <laughs> Having said that, another example is that CVP may lead to um, over uh, resuscitation if you just chase a target uh, static uh, value of CVP and has been referred to as iatrogenic saltwater drowning by Paul Marek. And also Jean-Louis Vincent in his uh, editorial pointed that we must not give fluids to chase static preload parameters. So in abdominal hypertension, you see opposite things. CVP will increase when abdominal pressure increases, but volumetric indices like global and systolic volume will decrease. So remember, CVP is totally useless and will not give you the right answer when it comes to preload of these patients. We studied in a PIC model and looked at transmural CVP in the setting of abdominal hypertension, and indeed, when intra-abdominal pressure is highest, <coughs> transmural pressures are at their lowest. So, <coughs> problem is that apart from animal data, there is not much uh, clinical data. So we could make the CVP better by making it transmural CVP. And if you would look at changes in CVP over changes in abdominal pressure, you could calculate this abdominal thoracic index of transmission. And you have to believe me that on average, it's about 50%. So if your nurse tells you that the CVP is 20, but abdominal pressure is 20, transmural CVP will be around 10, which may be uh, an indicator of a preload of a patient that might need some further fluids. So if you remember the slide of the wedge at the five stages, compression and PEEP, the wedge was at the highest, but the global endostolic volume is at the lowest level. So in abdominal hypertension, volumetric preload gives a better uh, indicator of the true preload status of our patient. It has also been shown by echocardiography, uh, as you can see, that left ventricular and diastolic area, the volumetric parameter, decreases when abdominal pressure increases. So what about contractility? Again, from animal data, if you increase abdominal pressure, you see a rightward, downward shift of Frank Starling curves, so abdominal hypertension decreases contractility. Also shown in this study by uh, children during laparoscopy with uh, transesophageal echo and the anteroceptal segments, you see a decrease of contractility during uh, insufflation during laparoscopy. So another interesting question is, uh, what is the Frank Starling curve of my patient and where is my patient on this curve? As we know that abdominal hypertension may decrease uh, contractility, uh, 
it's important to assess the volume in relation to the contractility or ejection fraction. There are different normal values, whether it comes to right ventricular or left ventricular, and for a global ejection fraction, the normal value is around 35% uh, or more. And you will uh, um, stay with me when I say that the, when the ejection fraction is small, <coughs> the heart is dilated, so the resting global endastolic volume will be bigger compared to a good heart with a good global ejection fraction, this heart will have a smaller volume. So by combining the ejection fraction uh, with the volume, we can still uh, assess a low volumetric preload even in a patient with a low uh, ejection fraction. So this would be uh, a lesson in abdominal hypertension to correlate ejection fraction with endastolic volume. So what about afterload? We performed a study with uh, uh, Gregorio Castellanos from Murcia in Spain in pigs where we uh, introduced the uh, intestinal occlusion model. So the uh, bowels of the pigs were uh, instilled with fluids, so because fluids are not compressible, so it's different than laparoscopy where CO2 can be compressed, uh, to have this gravity effect uh, on the kidneys. And indeed, if you uh, put these pigs in a CT, you can appreciate then when the aorta enters the abdominal cavity, is just squeezed down by the intra-abdominal pressure, resulting in an increased uh, afterload. Um, so, in summary, the effects of abdominal hypertension are direct vascular compression, elevation of the diaphragm, compression of the organs, which may result in some hormonal uh, changes, uh, increases in pressures, and this will finally result in a decreased preload, decreased contractility, increased afterload, and a drop in cardiac output. So this together would also result in a drop in abdominal perfusion pressure in analogy to cerebral perfusion pressure, which is the mean arterial pressure minus the intra-abdominal pressure. So what about functional hemodynamics, SVV, PPV, passive leg raising? Can we use it when the abdomen is distended? So there's not much data. There is some animal uh, data. And basically, it shows that when you increase abdominal pressure, you see that there is an increase in pressure variations. And these studies usually also measure esophageal pressure, so you can calculate this index of transmission. And for this study, the transmission was around 60%. Uh, and you can see that the higher the intra-abdominal pressure, the higher the PPV and SVV and SPV values, but mainly this was a delta-up phenomenon. So not necessarily related to fluid responsiveness. So intra-abdominal hypertension increases are known uh, functional hemodynamic parameters as PPV, SVV, by the increase in intrathoracic pressure. There's another animal study, which is before and after blood withdrawal, zero and 30 abdominal pressure. You see that PPV increases up to values of 40, 60%. And if you then calculate the thresholds for fluid responsiveness, that would be an SVV above 67 and a PPV above 41. So that's far beyond the 12 or 15% that we use uh, in patients. So it's difficult to extrapolate this to the bedside, but it may be that we need to use higher thresholds to define fluid responsiveness in the setting. As on average, if you increase abdominal pressure from 10 to 20, you double the values of SVV, PPV, and SPV. So in France, the, they use um, uh, active leg raising, sorry. Uh, in the ICU, we use passive leg raising. And in this study of patients that were all fluid responders, it was found out that half of them were passive leg raising negative, non-responders. And those patients had a high abdominal pressure. So the hypothesis is that uh, when abdominal pressure is normal and you do the passive leg raising, you have a venous return from the legs and the mesenteric veins, but if you have abdominal hypertension, you have a diminished uh, venous return, and you won't have this autotransfusion effect. So passive leg raising can be false negative. And in those situations, maybe it's better to go for the trend lumbar position, where the belly can hang free, and then you can have some autotransfusion uh, effect. Are there still people not believing uh, on the importance of abdominal pressure? Please raise your hand. Don't be shy. Everyone believes it, but for those who would not believe, let's. 
Tidal volumes 130 ml. Peak pressures on the ventilator 55 centimeters of water. And then you have cardiac arrest. So what we saw here in the burn unit was a severe burns with fluid overload, hypothermia, abdominal distension, very high peak pressures, low tidal volumes, and a cardiovascular collapse. So abdominal compartment syndrome kills. So you need to measure the pressure in order to uh, treat the cause. So just one more thing about this polycompartment syndrome and this organ-organ interaction and this transmission of pressures from abdomen to thorax to brain. Uh, is that in 2007 we coined the term polycompartment syndrome. Why poly? Because the multi-compartment syndrome has been referred to as the uh, fascia uh, and the problems with uh, multiple uh, compartments within uh, the muscles of the peripheries. So if you go back to um, patients with congestive heart failure who have worsening renal failure, data pointed towards increased venous pressures and venous congestion as a culprit, as we heard in the previous talk, on right ventricular failure and high venous pressures and venous congestion. But if we realize that when intra-abdominal pressure is increased, this will also result in an increase in central venous pressure, pulmonary vein pressure, and renal venous pressure. So all the terms that we are familiar with is cardiorenal syndrome, hepatopulmonary syndrome, or hepatorenal syndrome, I would like to introduce an extra letter and go for CARS, cardioabdominal renal syndrome, hepatoabdominal pulmonary syndrome, and hepatoabdominal renal syndrome. When you look at the heart and the kidneys, they're closely connected. And if you put an A in between, you get a CAR. And when it comes to CARS, this was coined in 2012. Um, we understand that if you have a patient with congestive heart failure and the kidneys go worse, and the patient is going for dialysis, that the CVP is the most predictive factor to predict worsening renal failure more than cardiac index. But now we know that this increase in CVP is related to an increase in intra-abdominal pressure amongst other factors that will eventually lead to increased sodium reabsorption and cardio-abdominal renal syndrome. So in some patients, deteriorating kidney function this may be caused by constipation, simple as that. You give an enema, laxatives, abdominal pressure drops, and you can avoid dialysis for the time being. So remember polycompartment syndrome and think about CARS. As abdominal pressure may be the missing link explaining worsening kidney failure. So ladies and gentlemen, to wrap things up, Think of polycompartment syndrome and think of transmissions of pressures from one compartment to the other, from the abdomen to the thorax to the CVP and also on pulse pressure variations. Think about cardioabdominal renal syndrome. Use volumetric indices rather than barometric ones because those will falsely increase. Use global endostolic volume or volumetric swung guns, right ventricle endostolic volume or echography and the diastolic area and think about these corrections uh, for ejection fraction. You can calculate at the bedside the abdominal thoracic index of transmission by looking at airway pressures, filling pressures, and abdominal pressure. And you can estimate the transmural filling pressure by just subtracting half the intra-abdominal pressure from the end expiratory value. So give the right fluids right, and of course, hypovolemia will aggravate the symptoms, but hypovolemia, as we've seen, will not make things better either. So it's a fine balance. Resuscitate towards abdominal perfusion pressure, as we do for the brain. Be cautious with the functional hemodynamics. And studies shown that PPV has the best predictive value. And think that passive leg raising may be false uh, negative, even in a fluid responder. Thresholds should be adapted, so not above 12 or 15 percent, but rather 20 to 24 percent to identify fluid responsiveness. And on the website, uh, you can find the treatment uh, algorithm. Having said that, I invite you to join us in Campinas in 2019, Brazil, and later this.